Welcome to this video application note brought to you by the Analytical Scientist and Marx International. It is entitled Simple and Reliable Quantitation of Parts Per Trillion Level Polycyclic Aromatic Hydrocarbons in Air by Thermal Desorption GCMS. Our presenter is Dr. Caroline Widdison, who is the Product Marketing Manager for Thermal Desorption at Marx International, a specialist manufacturer of analytical thermal desorption instrumentation, associated sampling equipment and time of flight mass spectrometry. Caroline participates in many standards and regulatory committees, including CEN, ISO, ASTM and BSI, and works closely with industry, test labs and research institutes to equip and advise on the analysis of VOCs and SVOCs. Caroline, over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Rich. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are widely recognised as a particularly harmful group of organic compounds, with documented carcinogenic, mutagenic and tetragenic properties. PAHs are formed as a result of the incomplete combustion of organic materials, such as coal, gasoline and wood. And as a result, they're particularly uh, prevalent in urban and industrial environments. This, combined with their toxicity, has resulted in the implementation of very low levels for urban and workplace air. And although PAHs can be analysed by GCMS, they cover a relatively wide volatility range from naphthalene all the way through to benzopyrrolene. This means that the lower volatility PAHs tend to be bound in particulate matter as well as being present in the air. Typically, these have been analyzed by a, a relatively labor-intensive process, very multi-step, uh, which can be prone to errors. This is reflected in many of the global standard methods for the analysis of PAHs, of which you can see a list here. Most of these require the use of quartz filters to trap the particulates, backed up by a sorbent cartridge to collect the vapor phase fraction and indeed any analyte that are released from the particulate matter during sampling. This filter cartridge system is rigorously conditioned before being used for air sampling and then is solvent extracted, concentrated and subject to a silica gel cleanup, followed by direct injection into a GCMS system. This lengthy multi-step process uh, can sometimes be prone to errors. And in addition, the use of solvent um, raises any concern about volatility of analytes being lost during the evaporation stage. It raises the possibility of cross-contamination between samples. And it means that the protocol is not always environmentally responsible. Consequently, over the last few years, there have been a high demand for more efficient techniques for the sampling of PAHs and their introduction into a GC system. Thermal desorption offers a number of well-known advantages over solvent extraction for a wide range of VOCs and SVOCs, the major one really being the great improvement in sensitivity due to the avoidance of dilution, the high extraction efficiency, and the efficient transfer and injection to the GC. And this sensitivity advantage means that the 1,000-plus litre sample volumes and large sampling flows that are traditionally required for this type of analysis uh, can be substantially reduced, simplifying the sampling process. Thermal desorption also interfaces with the same type of GCMS um, and analytical instrumentation that's widely used for standard VOC monitoring for things such as benzene in ambient air. To the right of the slide, we can see uh, a diagram that shows us how thermal desorption works. And this is broken down into two stages. The first stage is where the sample tube, which has been had a sample of ambient air pumped onto it, is placed inside the thermal desorption instrument. A flow of gas is applied, and the compounds of interest on the sorbent tube are swept from that tube onto our focusing trap. This focusing trap is typically held anywhere between room temperature down to minus 30 degrees, depending on the analytes of interest. At this point, we can split, which we term our inlet split, and this split can be recollected onto a clean sorbent tube. The focusing trap is then heated up in the second stage of thermal desorption and the reverse flow of gas through the focusing trap transfers the compound of interest to the GC column and to the detector. At this point, we can also split for a second time and this split is termed the outlet split. At this point, the vapors of interest can be taken onto the clean sorbent tube and recollected. These tubes can then be reanalyzed at a later date. So with this in mind, Marx 
came up with a new sorbent tube that has been developed for the dedicated analysis of PAHs in ambient air. And this approach has been building on earlier work with PAHs, but also complementing the standard typical VOC monitoring methods uh, that are so used to being run on sorbent tubes. For example, standard methods for ambient air monitoring, such as US EPA 2017, uh, methods on pump sampling onto sorbent tubes, such as ISO 16017. Then we have um, methods taking samples from indoor air or from chamber testing, such as ISO 16000 Part 6, and also looking at the Chinese EPA methods for ambient air monitoring and source monitoring as well. These thermal desorption uh, tubes and traps that have been specifically uh, designed offer excellent reproducibility and linearity for these really challenging analytes. In addition, the high linear velocities through the system in the flow path and the temperature uniformity of instrumentation such as the TD100XR automated thermal desorber um, provide really well-resolved chromatography and give confidence to distinguish between those various PAHs of interest. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the methodology surrounding the analysis of PAHs using sorbent tubes and thermal desorption. Here we have an example of a standard solution of PAHs being injected onto a PAH TD sorbent tube using a calibration solution loading rig. 10 nanograms per compound of the relevant 18 compounds were injected onto the sorbent tube. Following the injection onto the tube, that tube was flushed with a range of volumes of air. And this was to simulate real world sampling. So here you can see we have a list of different volumes uh, that were passed through the sorbent tube. And they were um, done so at relatively high flow rates for sorbent tube sampling, 330 milliliters, using an Activoc pump. And this was done to um, determine the capabilities of achieving the necessary detection limits. We also are going to show some real world samples that were taken in Shanghai, and they were pumped onto a PAH sorbent tube at 250 mils per minute for 12 hours, giving a total volume of 180 liters. So this first chromatogram that you can see is just the standard that has been run with the relevant compounds. And below we have a blank run showing the, um, the removal of all um, compounds from the tube and showing negligible carryover within the system. As with all thermal desorption analysis, it's important to have a look at the linearity. So the linearities were calculated using five tubes, and they were loaded with this um, PAH standard at a range of 0.1 to 10 nanograms. These tubes were also flushed after they had been spiked, and this time with 455 liters of nitrogen to simulate the high volume sampling. And the linearities were excellent. All the R squared values were found to be above 0.98. With such high volumes being taken onto a sample tube, it's important to think about breakthrough. And breakthrough um, is when the analytes that are taken onto a tube, um, the volume is increased so much so that the, the compounds of interest could come out off the other end of the tube. So what we need to do is make sure that when we um, check for this, the analytes are sampled under different conditions. So four tubes were spiked with the same quantity of PAH standard, which was 10 nanograms per component. And a blank tube was placed in series, so after the, the sorbent tube. Three of these tubes were set up, were flushed with gas, and had very similar responses from all four tubes under all the different conditions. So here we can see um, a schematic of how the um, breakthrough check was set up. So we have our first tube, which um, has our 475 litres of real air taken onto it, and a blank tube behind that. And what we're looking for is to see no compounds of interest on the second tube, which was the case here. So let's now look at a real-world sample. So to assess the performance of the analytical setup, we took 180 litres of urban air, and this was pumped onto a clean, conditioned PAH sorbent tube. And we had also got a second tube placed in series. And it was analyzed as we previously described. And you can see the results in the chromatogram above. It shows the complexity of the air sample and the amount of very low level PAHs that were measured. So in conclusion, confirming the findings of a much more comprehensive independent study, um, this work has demonstrated that the use of sorbent tubes with thermal desorption GCMS offers a really reliable way of looking at, at PAHs in the air. 
Um, it's an alternative to these existing methods, uh, which are somewhat time-consuming uh, and cumbersome. And particular strengths of this approach are the fact that we can take very high volumes of air and they can be collected on these tubes with, with minimal carryover for the target semi-volatile analytes. We've got very low detection limits and excellent reproducibility for all of the PAHs uh, that are typically of interest from naphthalene through um, to benzopyridine. As I mentioned, this work was looking at some published methodology that had been put forward uh, by Vito Test Laboratory from Belgium. So I've listed both of the papers that might be of interest here uh, and also um, some additional case studies that you can find on our website. If you have any further uh, questions or would like more information on this application, then please contact us on the uh, information below. Thank you very much for your time.